in my opinion, this is my opinion, take it with <laughs> Polish salt mines levels of salt. We have um, reached the salt part of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We need Morton as uh, a sponsor. <laughs> In the vein of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien meeting at the Eagle and Child, this is the Broodcast, Inkling-style Discord chat, last Friday of every month. To join our ranks of writers and artists, please visit joshuadavidling.com slash brood. And now, the Broodcast on the Poets at War Creative Network. I will probably be reading Joel's first. There's your brother. There's oh, yeah. Daniel. Nope. You're so starved for attention. You're a minute late. What happened? I'm just playing. <laughs> uh, I got. I actually got busy uh, right writing a little bit. I was looking at it. I should have just said, you know, go ahead if you feel like it. But right. Dang, that looks good. <laughs> I have a. What, what uh, are you looking? I, well, you're not gonna see it until tomorrow or so when it comes out but i have a new look okay. for the broodcast and i'm just admiring okay. it over here in obs it's good it's really nice yeah. <laughs> kind of doing a soft reboot to everything as you know uh i asked you to be on a show um soon so that's part of it yeah. but yeah basically everything is kind of getting revamped um okay so yeah but uh yeah what's been up oh, man goodness I've, um, today has been, a, I got a slow start today. I've stayed up really late last night just for no good reason. Uh, the night before that, I actually got to bed at like a really good time and I took like a nine hour power nap. I felt great on top of the world. And then, of course, I, I just very much the reclusive artist that lives by himself. So tapping into that energy a little bit today. I'm just <laughs> being productive. Ah. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. That's fine. Just been brainstorming game ideas and stuff. And I actually I ended up writing just now and it's always fun. It's like the little imp or whatever. Impromptu. <laughs> Forgot. Yeah, no. I there's this uh idea of like that. I oh goodness, it's fine. That that'll come back to me at some point. Uh, I had a moment of inspiration, and I was like, oh wait, what if her water breaks? No, and I was like, oh crap, that's actually really good. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. it's um, I, it's a delicate dance of I I have to give enough information so that my readers will know what's happening or at least be able to talk to their parents and be like hey what's happening um and it's like and we can all cry together a little bit um right, right. yeah so that, that's kind of the general vibe i want to go for for the story like yeah we all have it but i like i'm gonna actually just encourage families to read together more mm -hmm. um and so yeah this can definitely be like a story for the older kids um and stuff so there's a lot of kids at my church that i've been talking to and it's like oh yeah no i know what my audience is now it's it's like the teen, uh middle schoolers turning teenagers to young adults Yep. Um, and their parents and that kind of, oh my goodness, my ears are ringing so bad all of a sudden. Uh, Middle school but, is yeah, no, generally it's... in society an underserved group. It seems like okay, everything is yeah. generally for, you know, like a, a late elementary school or uh, high school. Like everything for kids right. is like in that range. And then that middle school range. Yeah. And part of it's because everything's firing off and they're not very fun to be around, <laughs> generally speaking. Right. But part of it is just yeah. like people don't make the attempt, you know? Yeah. So. No, and I, I really, I want to counteract. I know that a lot of these kids don't have 
like a lot of the homeschool families that I interact with, they just don't really have a whole lot of stories that they can show their kids mm -hmm. that um, instill good values and have good storytelling and have all like the things that they need uh, to instill like good values uh and they're all like oh look how bad the parents are and we're gonna vilify them and blah and it's like why not just like have the parents be amazing yeah and sacrificial and love their children and that's one of the reasons i love the wing feather saga <laughs> yeah it is so good I, I really, it's the whole family I you know didn't, I, I went to one of his uh, concerts. It was at a local mega church. Yeah. Um, and it was just really, really good. I, I mm -hmm. like his music. I love him and his vibe, the way he goes about things. I love that it's like this collective of bards. Oh, yeah. And the rabbit room and stuff. I just yeah. Really, I just really need to network hard enough to find a connection point. For yeah. us with him. Well, so we've we can, had, you know. uh, honestly, that's where I found a lot of the early people who were involved with what I was doing before it was even the brood. Um, I found them through either Rabbit Room or um, <clears throat> Rabbit Room actually, pro they, they, they allowed, they, I think they still allow you to promote other groups if they're, you know, in the same vein. Um, but right. generally speaking, they... Um, they were promoting a group called Fel uh, Fellowship and Fairy Dust, which I think is still a thing, but I haven't had a lot of connection with them in a while. Um, Sarah was heavily involved there. She was a chief editor for them, and then she stopped doing that for them and started Logo Sophia. Um, but I also had already started what was the, um famling uh uh messenger group which was basically like okay i'm a guy who's writing stories and doing vlogs and stuff and i'm gonna this is the easiest way for me to send them to you so here you go join this messenger yeah. group and that eventually became the brood <laughs> so what i need i i feel like what we need is like a website for all of the members of the brood and all of their projects and places you I've, can get connected I've, with them. I've, I've tried that, and also that stuff is on my website. It is all there. <laughs> I figured it was, and you'd be the guy to talk to. It's the just... thing is, getting another name for it, I'm like, okay, where are we driving people? And I've been driving at joshuadavidling.com for so long, I think it's eventually going to be Poets at War. Um, but like getting, getting to that point <laughs> takes money and all kinds of other stuff. Right now I have a yeah. free domain, free domain with a friend, um, that lets me do stuff on my website. But the thing is, a lot of people don't want to do stuff on websites. They just want an app on their phone that gives them notifications. <laughs> right, <laughs> and it's like, yeah. that's the hard part. Cause even you are not a huge fan of discord, right? Because it's more things. It's not just direct yeah. access talking to people so it's like i gotta do this weird right. hybrid dance and figure things out as i go everything you're saying like i've done over and over and over <laughs> my apartment it looks like a nightclub or something it's i love it much fancier than what i've got right now <laughs> i used to have the lights vibe. in the other room but See, i haven't I gotten bulbs for this shelves. room yet yeah I need bookshelves, a cabinet full of like all my beverages, mm -hmm. things. Who we got? Brendan. Awesome. Good evening, friend. Oh, and Kareth. Wonderful. I know you're getting set up. And Tristan. We can't hear you, but you're that muted, I think. But yeah, there he is. Yes, we are muted. I was just trying to wait till we got the baby involved. <laughs> What's Look up, Tristan? Hey, it's so good to see yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. It's so good to see you. He is he is 14 months. He will be 15 months in next oh, week. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. 
Hi. Hi. He is like he's aware of what's happening all of a sudden. Well, he sees himself and he sees other people. <laughs> yeah. And we're waving and saying hi. Hi. <laughs> Baby face. Baby. Okay, listen, you sir need to go to bed. <gasps> night night time. <laughs> night night. Oh, man. Night night. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, we'll be back um, on in a minute. I just wanted to share the baby because this is truly my greatest creation. Dang right it is. For now. <laughs> then there will be a second one and I won't be able to say that anymore. Woo! <laughs> All right. All right, see you in a minute. But for anybody watching, no, we're not saying that. We're, we, we're, not, we're not having a kid yet. I'm just saying we are planning on more. Okay. All. <laughs> All right. I'll be back. Alrighty. Having that I'm writing stuff, uh, like actually trying to write a book and working in ABA, working on doing all that stuff, uh, it's helped a little bit with the dating profile. Mm hmm. Yep. It helps a little bit. Imagine that. You have a mission, you have a purpose. Hello, yeah. Alex. And I... Hello. Hey. Whoa. LED lights, dude. What's it, up, dude? My apartment, it looks like a nightclub. It does. It Daniel. Cool. <laughs> is Debbie there? What, huh? Yeah, I heard Debbie. Yes, Debbie is there. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> oh. business you don't even have to play music to play the bass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good idea. Hey, Daniel, so, yeah. you want a business idea? What? Nightclubs for deaf people. You don't even <laughs> have to play go. music. You just have to play bass. Nice, nice. <laughs> it's I mean, just bass do... and flashing lights. I mean, they still appreciate the music, so. <laughs> but, like, you just... market it towards people who, have... can they appreciate the music if they are completely deaf? I mean, they can still feel it. So, I mean, but yeah, but also it, it, sign like, language really, really small. It's such a like eh, you could do like a I mean, not really like a nightclub. It sounds it just doesn't like that doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like I get what you're saying. It could be like a concert venue or straight edge rave or bar. bar. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Oh boy. <clears throat> yep. So, Alex, uh, had you read that Wendell Berry thing before? I had not. What did you think, honestly? Because I was waiting on you to be like, this is weird, other than that one little thing you said. <laughs> oh, is this a burnt mm. marshmallow? <laughs> Probably. 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 Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll be get, I'll getting, I'll be getting video on uh, at some point in time uh, in mm -hmm. the future. We're over at mom and dad's right now. Uh, we're going to you. go to Bethany. We have internet at Bethany. So yes, that'll be good. Um, yes, but uh, no, I feel like it's. <laughs> I feel like part of it is really good. I feel like mm -hmm. the uh, it uh, the uh, this is what a thing should have to be in order to replace something that already exists. I think that those principles are actually really solid. Mm -hmm. Um, I oh, just goodness. think that he it falls into the thing that you've shot down so many times that everybody talks about uh, currently with AI but it happened with computers as well. Uh, the It will take jobs, not create jobs. Right, right, thing. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th that's just not, that's just not right. Yeah, the zero-sum game, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. he's, actually, he's actually looking at it in kind of a zero-sum manner, which is really weird because he's a farmer, and farming is just about the least zero-sum thing you can do. <laughs> right, right, I'll exactly. I'll pause real quick so I can get my hoodie on because I'm, like, desperately I mean, trying to... <laughs> Not miss it. 
That, you just, you got it, bro. Just keep keep moving. For like two seconds. A greater <laughs> and greater proportion <laughs> of arms. Things, but I can't hear. And... Yeah, a greater, a greater and greater, greater proportion okay, of continue. arms are coming under the ownership of mega corporations, and right. it, yeah, it, it is indeed harder and harder for people to um, own their own farms. Um. Right. That wasn't what he was saying, necessarily. Um, yeah. AI, whenever it comes to agriculture, I don't think AI will replace jobs. No. Mm-hmm. AI well, doesn't... He, he's re- talking... A- he's- go ahead. Go. You go. I was just going to say, AI doesn't really actually replace jobs. It creates other jobs. <laughs> That's yeah, what I mean, like- think. It no. does, though. The, the problem that... I don't know if you're talking about the agriculture sector in particular, but the problem that the agriculture sector is primarily facing because of this is is just that it, 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 because of the advantage advancements in technology, um, farming requires a greater and greater upfront investment in order to be competitive, which is a regulative problem more than a technological problem. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so uh, i'm reading it's um i don't know i'm sorry to just like randomly interrupt you there but i've been using ai here and there and it's been helpful uh Mm -hmm. in like gathering information quicker than google it's basically just searching google for you like a hundred times faster than you could and And it's not always giving accurate but you can fact check if need be you know AI is significantly worse than any single online, random online source in terms of its factual accuracy. Right. Depends on what, lo- like what language important. model you're using, really. Because a lot of the oh, ones I, that, are, that are newer actually most, do better. Well, the, even the most advanced ones are worse. And they're all terrible. What was the last one you used? I, um... I wouldn't Four? go to Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> Chat GPT why. four. This is okay. No, no, no. I'm talking ones newer than Chat GPT four. <laughs> four. Um. So you are correct. Any given AI is almost certainly going to be less accurate than any given, uh, well, like any reputable online source. That's right. Not just uh, generally speaking. What? Not just. He's the saying any ones. random source. Yeah. I will take chat GPT over slate.com any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Yeah. I actually would not. <laughs> really? The, yes, because the problem is artificial intelligence does not have a human perspective on what information is actually um, important. So it does give you what may look appear to be a comprehensive list, but the the actual thought process behind what information is included and is not, it's nothing like the thought process that a human would go through. Um, So it often leaves out very important stuff to any topic you know anything about. Yes. Brendan's back. But they do that. Hey, Brendan. Yeah, it turns out that we were debating it. uh, Hey, Alex. Turns out again. Turns out we forgot. Did you just call me an alien AI? No, no, he said we're debating yeah. AI. Oh, yes, I did. Well, I'm AI not going to be around for the AI debate because I have to go back and get stuff that we forgot at the grandparents' house. But Kirith wants uh, to listen in on the broadcast. Okay. So I'm having you guys on, and I'm going to mute. So are you both okay. going to share okay. later if you have the chance? If I get the ch- chance, I will try to share something. Do you want to share something? Kirith wants to share something. Something <laughs> I've been encouraging her to do. So I'm, awesome. I'm glad that she is. She is. So we'll try to wait till you're back. All right, ma'am. I will try to be fast. Okay. Not too fast. What? Don't break laws. <laughs> All righty then. Okay. All right. We definitely have enough I was going to say the exact same thing, Daniel. <laughs> um, can, can we continue this conversation uh, with Aaron and Daniel about AI? Do you we okay want to do that or um, do we want to go ahead and get to Joel's uh, story? I'm going to leave it up to you. I would like to continue the conversation, though. I personally am writing what I am going to share. 
So. Okay. We can come back I to it another time. Aaron, I think that's him saying he'd prefer to the story time. Uh, go to the next thing to story time T- okay. to not be involved in a conversation where I have to think yeah. aloud. Alrighty. So let me get to what we're reading from tonight for Joel, what he sent in. When, uh, whenever his D and D group takes a break, I'm sure he'll jump in and, you know, be more of a regular part. But for now he is in interacting and enjoying. And for people who, uh, are, Oh, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping for people who are, uh, jumping in. Uh, you can send stuff to the broadcast, Joshua David Ling at gmail.com, and I can read it on the air and we can give you feedback on the air. But also our groups in Discord and Facebook Messenger regularly talk about stuff that happens on the broadcast after the fact. And so we're able to catch up with each other, even if we're not all on live. We do have a new look to the broodcast. If you're watching this now, you will see it. If you're actually part of it right now, you will not because I don't really have a way to show it through Discord in a satisfying way. Um, So basically, uh, yeah, there's going to be a new look and a new feature for all of you listening. um, And Kirith, you can fill Brendan in when he gets back. um, We have a new feature where you can send it to me via a direct message or the chat or however you can get uh, a message to me, just send hashtag clip and that will give me a time code that I can then match up to the video for making social media clips. And so that would be really helpful. Anyone who wants to help out, anyone who finds a moment really fun or funny or anything like that that you think would do well, just a highlight, go ahead and just put hashtag clip and uh, we'll we'll see what we can do with that. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you can put it anywhere in a DM, in the chat, just anywhere that gets to me in the Brood Facebook Messenger, whatever. So that's what's up there. And we will go ahead and get into Joel's reading for tonight. This is uh, written by him, just the little housekeeping he has beforehand. It says where this is in the book. Kit is returning from picking up the firemen. Swing is coming directly from the last chapter you heard. Swing is the uh, m- little monkeyish character that we heard last time. A uh, monkeyish alien. What has happened in- up until now? Hannah is Zoe's grandmother. I don't know if that's Hannah or Hana. Um, is Zoe's grandmother and is on vacation in Florida. Zoe was supposed to s- to come, but had to stay to observe a surgery that she had to write a paper on. Kit and Fox have lived with the aliens for quite a few years as soldiers in their war. Neon is a handler that guides Fox through their mental link as he fights. She is watching from his eyes and satellite images. When I use quotation marks and italics, that signifies messages to or from the mental links. Here we go. Kit was hanging out of the door as the helicopter lowered. As soon as it touched down, he jumped out, leaving Hal to escort the generals to to their various destinations. Jogging to the hangar, where where Swing and Kaz were waiting for him, he pulled off his jacket and threw it aside. He pulled his shirt off, revealing a series of sockets that crossed his shoulder blades and extended down his spine. The two Corkins rushed in to install a T-shaped device that was secured to his back. Attaching to connection points that had been installed so many years ago in every third vertebra. Kit flexed and stretched, making sure the device was comfortable. The Quarkins leapt back as a pair of bright purple translucent glowing wings extended from his back. Kit flapped them twice before they dissolved in a shower of sparks. A large grin stretched across his face. Swing and Kaz jumped and whistled in excitement then helped him don his armor. As Kit stretched, making sure his armor was comfortable, as the small aliens ran to and uh, ran to the now-empty helicopter, several men had dragged some heavy crates over. Like a race car pit team, they began installing the equipment on the underside of the fuselage, while the, while the ground crew topped off the tank. Kit finished strapping on his holsters and the other various bits of gear, then hurried back to the chopper to meet up with his fire team. 
Kaz climbed over the pilot's seat to finish programming the alien tech into the flight computer. Kit was just about uh Kit was just getting back in the helicopter, about to give Hammer a fist bump when Ashley chimed in, chimed in his implant. I have Hannah on the line, the lady you sent to Florida. She is trying to get back to New York. She saw the news and said her granddaughter Zoe is still here. She said she was observing a surgery in the hospital today. What should I tell her? And then it goes to 15, wake up call. So it's changing chapters, I believe, but it could be sections, I'm not sure. Zoe struggled to gain consciousness. Her head hurt. Her body ached. She was disoriented, dizzy, and unable to remember where she was. Her phone was vibrating in her pocket. That must have been what woke her up. Without looking at it, she pulled it out and hit the lock button, canceling the call, then put it back. The floor was cold and hard. There was a dripping noise. There was a dripping noise. She rubbed her head and opened her eyes. The world was a blurry mess. Zoe blinked until it came back into focus. What she saw still didn't make any more sense to her. She was in a shower, with a door on each side, slumped against a corner. Zoe reached up and opened the door and, f and half fell, half slid into a very small room with a row of sinks down one wall. As she looked around, she saw a huge door on the far end of the room. Large signs warned her about keeping the next room sterile. Finally, Zoe recognized the decontamination shower she had just left. Through the mental fog, she realized she was in the washroom adjacent to the surgery suite. One of the sinks was leaking. She stared at it, confused. That was the dripping sound. The water was dripping off the front of the sink, cascading to the floor two feet away and gathering in a puddle against the far wall. That's not right. In her mental, in her mental haze, she knew this meant something significant, but couldn't decide what. She stood up slowly. The effort was met with soreness and a fresh wave of dizziness. Zoe shut her eyes and embraced herself on one of the sinks, trying to stop the room from spinning. She tried to remember what had happened. She had been attending a heart surgery with her class. It was done arthroscopically, and they were all watching a large screen as, as the head surgeon, Dr. Jackson, narrated his way through the body. It was all going fine when there was a large crash. The lights flickered, and everything went sideways. Zoe realized she had to have hit she had to have fallen into the shower and hit her head. The doors must have closed. After a minute, she opened her eyes and looked through the windows above the sink into the operating room. She saw a scene from a horror film. Blood was splattered everywhere. The patient on the table had been ripped open and his insides were strewn all over the floor. All of the surgical team were lying dead. Their scrubs were covered in large blood stains, surrounding deep wounds in various places across their bodies. The windows on the far side of the observation room had all been shattered. Some students, a year behind her, had been in there, taking notes. None of her classmates were visible. However, a bloody handprint on the glass indicated there was someone under the window. Zoe vomited in the sink, nauseated from the dizziness and the mental shock. When she finally looked up, she noticed movement on the far side of the operating table. It must be one of the students from the other class. He isn't wearing scrubs like her class. The man stood up. He had been hunched over a nurse, who was missing most of her throat. Blood dripped from his slack jaws and stained his shirt. Had he done that? She let out a shriek in disgust. The young man turned at the noise and to look at the to look for the source. His eyes were dull and lifeless. He made no attempt to clean the blood from his face. At the sound of her scream, two other younger students stood from behind the table and started shuffling towards her. In a panic, she turned and ran out the door. Fox smashed through the window in the building across the street from the hospital. There was one corrupted in the room. With a sideways glance, he drew his sword and slashed with a single motion, cutting through the top of its skull. Neon had already highlighted five targets for him in the next room. He kicked open the door 
to the next room and, and drew his second sword as he walked in. He decapitated the first immediately inside the door with a side swing, then lunged at the next two, slicing an X through the air into their brains. One staggered up behind him. Neon was watching and guided Fox to swing his wing up in an uppercut. He caught the corrupted under the chin and sent him flying across the room with another strike. Fox threw his sword at the same instant and the sword struck the corrupted, pinning it against the wall. The body hung limp, pinned by the sword stuck through its head. The last corrupted stumbled in front of him. Fox spun and slammed it with his wing with, en with enough force to shatter the window and send the corpse falling into the street below. Good job, Neon called. Fox pulled his sword from the wall and sheathed both. He went to the shattered window and looked across at the hospital, searching the windows for any movement. Do you have her? Fox asked. Yes, she is here. In his, in his hut, uh, do, H-U-D, heads up display, HUD, I don't know what is common to say. Um, Fox saw a large green circle that shrunk to a dot over the, over a window across the street. She ran into that room. She must be alive. He could make out a figure standing at the window looking out. Fox dialed the number Kit had given him. The figure jumped and reached into her pocket. There she is. Zoe's alive. I can still save her, he said as he turned, uh, he said as she turned from the window. There are two corrupted at the, at the door behind her, but she, is but she is alone in that room, Neon reported. There are many nanites on her. You must hurry. Without a beacon, I cannot redirect, uh, redirect all. D redirect them all. Do not shoot out the glass or you may scare her. Good thinking. Fox jumped across the hospital, gliding on his wings. He thumped down on the ledge in front of the window. He saw her sitting on the edge of a large hole in the floor. She turned back, to, back at him, a look of terror on her face. As soon as she saw him, she jumped into the hole. No! Both Neon and Fox thought. He shattered the glass and ran to the hole. Zoe had smashed through a glass wall in the conference room below, landing on her hands and knees in the hallway beyond. She tried to stand and collapsed with a cry of pain. Instead, she crawled, dragging her leg and leaving a large trail of blood, making a hole in the far wall. Several corrupted stalked behind her. Fox leapt down and sliced his way toward her, practically at a run. She was crawling into the hole, and one corrupted was pulling her back out. She kicked it off and tried to get away. Fox grabbed its neck so she so it couldn't bite her, and stabbed through its head. His swords came out of the other side and stuck in the wall. She was almost all the way through the hole. He shouted her name as he grabbed her leg and pulled her back. She rolled over and shrieked in utter terror. Fox used his wings to block himself and Zoe from the corrupted, trying to claw at them. He grabbed her and pulled her to her feet. In her wide, green eyes, he saw a look of absolute, absolute horror, that had been seen that he had seen before her leg had a large piece of glass sticking out her shoulder had a deep gash and both her face and arms showed dozens of cuts she slumped as the color drained from her usually rosy face making her freckles stand out more than normal against her now pale skin no and that's where we stop Waiting for people to unmute. Very good. He has a really, really good dialogue style. Uh, dialogue style. He does, and I really am starting to like his action a lot more. The whole like wings and swords thing, like for aliens coming in, is it's just a fun aesthetic. Uh huh. I I like it. <laughs> Other yep. thoughts. Other thoughts. I definitely uh, felt like he kind of is hitting, starting to hit his stride a bit more. I'm um, com coming in as I'm totally blind. And the other, uh, the other chapters have been sort of hard for me to follow, just not really having enough context to really like feel like I know what's going on in the story. But I feel like this is a very solid, uh, just solid chapter even out of context like 
It's like I got I Zoe was the main character, right? Zoe and Fox. Fox is the guy with the wings, Zo- yeah. Zoe and Fox. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so no, it was like the scene definitely it, it yeah, it plays out more naturally in my head and I can actually see what's going on. Well, you're more action action yeah. oriented right now in your mm-hmm. writing style and everything, so that makes sense. So yeah, uh, like, I, I, I also I also liked uh, how it switched perspectives uh, as like a, a, as she as she uh, became like right after she set the mood for the scene, I guess, with right. her being attacked and all that, it switches mm-hmm. perspectives to the guy coming in and saving her. Yeah, I thought that did. that worked really well. He has a good use of multiple perspectives that isn't yes. jarring. It feels more like a movie, yeah. and that's a hard thing to do in uh, like novel prose, like he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a lot harder to do that do it in that way than in like a script or something, you know. Um, and so that's that's really cool. One of the things that um, I did note there was at least one part where he I think he uh, I, I'd have to look at it again, but I think he he. Um, switch tenses but other than that i didn't notice anything weird or wrong um i thought it was i thought it was really good so yep all righty then uh aaron did you have anything and i don't know if kareth can unmute or not but if either of um, you have anything um I, not yet okay i uh was looking at it if you want to continue reading through the maiden's child you could um if you'd prefer i definitely can go through and work on it a bit more so okay well you decide later on if you want to do it uh and just pipe in and we'll yeah we'll we'll see what's up Um, so i could have sworn i I sent it to you in how to have i not have we not i don't know let me check you may have and i may have missed Um, it either way what i'm gonna do is i'm going into my google doc what email do i need to send this to Joshua David Ling at gmail.com. David. And that goes for anyone David. else who wants their stuff read on the broadcast once again. Right. Joshua David Ling at gmail.com. Yep. Debbie and I might have something to share. Ooh. Depending on whether or not we can pull uh, enough of a like pitch together. I'm down. So I'm definitely down. maybe. Maybe. It's it, it's a it's a maybe, but it, it we we will have something to share at some point in time. Okay, well, awesome. I I think I'm at a good stopping point for the thing I want to share. Okay, do you want to share immediately or not? Nah? My it seems like I might as well. Yeah, so I'm down. Pages. I'm down. Um, Daniel, right. once yours comes in, I'll have it ready in the can. And Debbie and Alex, you guys let me know. I'm guess we're we're gonna wait till Brendan's back for Kirith. So and I'm not sharing anything tonight. Yep. I've written a lot, but it none of it's really ready to share in any way. Or it's being shared very soon. So um we're I'm just with for you guys tonight. So all right. Cool, Leo. Um what I'm gonna start doing, I'll uh I'll just I'll be quiet, but I have a good spot where I think it'd be a good spot for us to stop if you're going to be reading it for me. Okay. All right. I I am going to check the word count real quick just because uh, um, small, what is it, spacing can be deceptive. Uh, what I've found, uh, a typical chapter is about 2,000 words, so... This is under. Do the whole drag and word count thing. If it's like a thousand words, that should be enough time. Yeah, just one thousand. All right. So, um, this is not the will of the wind. Instead, what I am going to be sharing is um, a little novelette that I've been wanting to work on. I've planned it out to be five relatively short chapters. Um, and it is called The Prince of Narsen. 
It is uh, set on a completely different world. Um, not going to give too much information, but it's it's dominated by humans. It's like medieval, basically. So, the first chapter of The Prince of Narsin, The Two Sisters. Vairi was pacing across the dark octagonal room. She received a letter yesterday which said that her sister, Adni, had arrived at a nearby inn. It was well past midday. She should have arrived hours ago. No candles were lit. It was still day after all. She would not light the candles in the day, except when it was necessary. Windows let in enough light. Wasting candles made her uncomfortable. Wasting money in general did that. That was a natural result of her poorer days. She wasn't truly used to possessing all the wealth she had swindled. Servants paced in and out of the room, carrying dishes, clothing, sweeping. Vairi ignored them. She nervously wiped cobwebs off the book, laid down books laid down in haphazard stacks on an old desk. They were left behind by the previous owner. Her own ledgers sat on a bench beside a window. They were also rarely o rarely opened, but when they were, she read them by sunlight. Vairi resisted the urge to run to the door, to leave the house, to search the city for her sister. She would have to wait. She knew she had to wait. They could not know her anxiety. It was the duty of a noble to look at those stupid letters, to examine those foolish maps, to know how she should manage her county, so that she might serve the king well by her rule. She scoffed. It was all busy work, really. She didn't really want to bother with tax collection this year. It was drudgery. Too long she waited, but after far too much time, her sister finally opened the door of her study. A servant stood behind her. Vairi cringed. Vairi, you look so different! Adni cried. In a formal setting, she was supposed to let the servant introduce her. Vairi stood stone-faced, unflinching. She turned her eyes to her head servant, Mantis. Leave us, a, leave us and ensure that none enter, she said. Adni looked at her sister with a great deal of confusion. The servant rushed to do as he was told. After so long, the door closed behind Adni. Suddenly, Vairi jumped forward and gave her sister a firm hug. I missed you, she cried. I missed you too, Adni replied. How is mother doing? Vairi asked as she stepped back to take a look at her sister. Adni shook her head. I'd rather not tell you. She's, she's not dead. You know enough already. Vairi nodded her head in understanding. It probably only got worse for them ever since Adni ran away. I'll find a way, Vairi said. Tiraka's in the mines now, Adni replied. I knew he was going to be sent away eventually, but... It's okay, it's okay. Vairi pulled her aside to one of the benches. She realized that she had no tissues or handkerchief of any kind in the room, so she tore pages out of old, useless books and gave them to Adni so she could wipe away her tears. And Muriel, our sister. Oh god, she's so... He... I, under I understand, I understand. You don't have to tell it all, Vairi said. We'll find a way. It took everything from Vairi to hold back her tears. It wasn't new to her, not really. Tevlin and Idolon kept an eye on her family for her and sent her reports. Before them, her boss Kimden had sent his own spies to protect them and threaten Lirael. Betraying Kimden was a risk, a serious one. It was not safe to use her new royally appointed spies to threaten a loyal subject to the king. That decision put her family in a dangerous situation. It wasn't hard for him to bribe the judge after. But even though she knew every detail she cared to know, hearing it all pour out from her sister was different. She hadn't seen her in years. Adni was barely a teenager when Vari left home. She knew it was necessary. She saw the writing on the wall. It's Bill broke Vairi to know what she, life she left her family to. She should have killed Liriel when she had the chance, when the Lord of the Underworld would do her bidding. She was too focused on gold and glory at the time. Her family suffered for it. 
they were lost, broken. But above all that, Adney's arrival made Vyrie realize that she had failed her sister and everyone else that was left behind. <sighs> we'll find a way, she insisted. She had to. Vyrie waited patiently as Adney cried. She waited for the girl to gather her strength. When the girl was ready, Vyrie brought up the plan. We have to get ready to leave, she said. I just got here, Adney replied. I know, Vyrie said, but Liriel is still chasing you. He knows my identity, he knows where you are running, and he will be here soon. Adney's face grew pale. Where are we going to? The king's palace, Vyrie replied. Don't worry, he is my friend. I had him schedule a ball that will be happening this Friday. When we are there, we should be able to keep him from taking you back. But he might just try something here, and I would have to explain to the king why my soldiers are attacking a simple traveler. Is it really safe? Adney asked. As safe as it can be, Vyrie replied. Remember, when we arrive, you are my cousin Elson. You recently became the Countess of Firin and Mayakar, after you married the recently widowed lord of that place. One of your uncles is one of our uncles is Ur is Count Urin of Taravon. He will be at the ball. You know him, you have known him for years, he is a familiar friend of yours. He will go along with anything we say. I have him wrapped around my fingers. What is this? Anne asked. It's your new identity. They will send you back to your master if they know that you're a runaway, Fiery replied. But why do I have to change my name? I don't even know what my car is. How am I supposed to convince them? You don't, Fiery replied. That's the beautiful thing. They all know I am lying. They just don't know what I am lying about. But as long as the king trusts me, they won't give you a second thought. You just have to do your best. Even if they know you're pretending, it will be fine. It will be fine, Adney. Just trust me. Attention, soldiers of creativity! Fall out for a commercial break! Hello, I'm Sarah Levesque, Editor-in-Chief of Logo Sophia Magazine. I would like to invite you to explore our Pilgrim's Journal of Life, Love, and Literature, both in visual format and in podcast format. Our goal is to help bridge the gaps between different Christian denominations and traditions. Please visit our website at logosophiamag.com to read or listen to stories, articles, poetry, and more, all for free. We look forward to journeying with you. Now is the time for your Book Recommendation Minute with Alexander Robertson, the part of the show where Alexander Robertson comes out and recommends a book. I was at the Fight, Laugh, Feast conference recently, and I picked up this gem from the Noggin Nose booth, where I was lucky enough to meet with the author. I expected that I would enjoy it, it was Doug Wilson's book of the month a while ago, but I did not anticipate exactly how fantastic it would be. However, before I continue with my praise, I probably ought to explain what exactly this book is. The Thing Is is a collection of five stories by Rivers Houseel. The subtitle is Short Stories of Things and the People that They Encounter, and it very much lives up to the promise of that subtitle. Each story is based around a meeting of thing and person and the events which follow. From a typewriter being found in the middle of the road by an aspiring writer, to a deformed potato found by a soldieress in the Women's Land Army amidst World War II, each story is beautifully crafted in every facet. The characters are believable to the point where I was convinced I had met many of them, and the form of the short story is so very well suited to these tales. It is a relatively rare thing for a book or story of any form to bring a tear to my eye, but multiple stories in this collection did. The themes of God's grace and sovereignty resonate very deeply with me, and the skill with which Miss Houseel works beautifies these themes and raises them to a level of glory which I have very rarely seen. This book is absolutely marvelous, and I recommend it heartily to everyone who has a taste for stories of any form. I am certain that nobody will be disappointed. In my part of the world, at least, to see a typewriter sitting in the middle of the road is not normal. But if I have learned one thing, it is that odd things do happen, and there it sat. Furthermore, I was raised to know that when one spies a typewriter in trouble, one rescues it. So I did. Excerpt from Of When a Typewriter Was Found, the first story in this collection. Attention, brave soldiers of artistry! Rally together as we resume our poetic march on Poets at War! like the concept that we know that they know that you know that I know. Um, 
you had a line and you said they know that I'm lying, but they don't know what I'm lying about. That that I know you're telling a story. I don't what that that was the only line that made sense to me. If I'm being completely honest, and I have our yes, it's not Legend of Two Okay, yeah, this little notebook comprises a good chunk of the world building that Aaron and I have created thus far, and it's indexed. This and is the other. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's a whole system that we have um, going on. And as he's talking, I have no earthly idea who he's talking about. I have our <laughs> nerd Bible here. That's because oh, it's um, not related oh, it's to Karatua. It's a is it in the same universe? It's it? um, it's te physically it's in a different universe. Oh my goodness! D Dan, remember when we talked about the three triverse thing idea? I did, I did. It's part of the multiverse thing that he's <laughs> yes for ages. Hey, and I keep telling him the multiverse bum, is connected bum, to like two to like magical re bum, relic already bum, in the story. <laughs> but anyways. It's going to be five chapters. It's going to be short. And it's not important. Okay. It, it's basically so, unconnected. Yes, but no. Yes, but it's, no. It's basically it's unconnected. Good. It's unconnected. It, yeah. <laughs> the Legend of Two Elves, that's in the Seven Worlds. This is in Parasilla. Different thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, now we're kind of... We yeah. have a couple... We have, like, three worlds... It's like he said yes. multiverse, and I said, "Oh, we, we're budgeting that." <laughs> well, it, it's that it's technically right three universes, but it's only three. It's not like multiverse anyway, theory. It's a an adjacent story. <laughs> <laughs> he knows that you know that I know that there's a multiverse. <laughs> okay. Um, as always, I very much like your writing style. Uh, you. you just have a very distinctive style that I greatly enjoy listening to. Um, I was busy trying to leave the house uh, as you're reading, so I cannot far uh, I cannot offer any further critique uh, or comment on the story itself. But I did enjoy listening to your writing style. Yeah, awesome. one of the things that you do yes. really well is um, classes um, of society, like like financial uh, uh and and or family familial class levels um seem to be a major part of your world building almost always and the way you use them is always interesting um there's a lot of uh political things going on even at the lower levels and that's always really fun to listen to so well done on that yeah. Um, I I do have a question though. One of the things yes. I wanted to do in this chapter was um, give the reader something of a sense, but not a complete sense of Vyrie's backstory. And I was wondering how much of that you were able to get. There was a sister that probably died or is captured, or something horrible happened to her. That's what I got. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's about what I got. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's definitely not much less than what I was trying to convey. Oh, gotcha. That's good. You saying something, Hazel? You want to say hi to people? Your hey, Hazel. Hi. They're saying hey to you. Hello. Hello. Well, do you need it tonight? I don't think you do, do you? I'll be right back. Okay. My phone is charging too. I can use this one. One moment here. Yeah. We're dealing with charging and such. Go ahead and relax I'll for a little in. bit, and once mine's up to a, a certain percentage, then I'll plug it into the fast charger. And if you come in a little later, you know, I might be able to get it to you, okay? All right? But right now, we'll put it on the slow charger, okay? <laughs> Love you. Good night. All right. Back to what we're doing. Okay. Um, But yeah, that answer your question, Aaron? Yeah, I think it did. Um, Dan answered it already by saying that the um, they know I'm lying, that the only line he understood was they know I'm lying, but they don't know what I'm lying about. He got already answered. 
<laughs> my question. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Well, we have Daniels, we have the Sunshines, and we potentially have the um, Robertsons almost. But you know, Debbie. Robertsons and, uh, almost sounds good. Yes. Robertsons almost. We'll nice. call it you that. want to jump on broadcast? No. Okay. okay. Then I will wait to figure that out. All right. No Sorry. problem. It's all good. It's all good. So Daniel would probably be next because I see Kirith and Brendan are not fully back yet either. Um, but we could potentially pause here for a little bit and talk about something if we want to. Uh, yep. it's up, up in the air as far as I'm concerned. Um, what do you guys, I'm good what do you guys that. feel like? Pause for a I'm minute. I'm good to just kind of pause, maybe talk and chill out. Maybe. Yeah, why not? Why not? So. Because we usually, every time I've gotten, like, every time we read, uh, my stuff, there is usually, like, no, no one. Oh. So. That's fair. That's fair. People are listening though. We have a, a decent yeah. decent group tonight. Um what and who at? knows? Other other people might jump in at some point. So we'll see. Nice. I know Abigail. I was gonna say, going do we to... know if Ian and TK are jumping in? I have not heard anything from them or Sarah. I know Sarah's been crazy busy. Um she had a being engaged does that to you. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh you would definitely know. Um yes. the uh I will say one cool thing she had, I won't say what she had me working on, but she had uh, something related to her wedding that she asked me to do um, and ended up being able to pay for a year of a service that I already needed to complete the task for her. Um, but I also get the tool for a year. So that's really cool. Um, awesome. So, so that's, that's been going well. Um I doubt I will probably be able to make it up to her neck of the woods for that wedding, but you know, at least I'll be there in the thing that I provide for the wedding. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, oh, I finally about? got my um, my uh, time off request for Adam for oh my goodness, Alex's wedding, Alex and Debbie's wedding. And when so, is that? Uh, that is that September seventh. Okay. Oh I don't even have a job to take time off from. <laughs> so I got no excuse. Mm. Looking forward to having you guys here. Yeah, nice. it's going to be a ton of fun. Maybe you can help me play test uh, the game I was talking to you about. Yes! I yes. also had ideas on. Aaron has ideas, and the further and we different. got into our discussion, it was like, Aaron, this is just a different game. <laughs> like, it, it's fine. <laughs> It sounds fun, but it's a different game. Aaron is incapable, and I love you, Aaron, and I say this with all the love and grace I possibly can. You are incapable of making a game that is not like a heavyweight strategic game that takes like eight hours to play. <laughs> not letting go I don't know no. about that. And I'm incapable of playing anything that is harder than apples to apples. Anyway. <laughs> what? That's more, that's more long really? line of what I'm trying to shoot for is more... Like more on that end, but you know, with a little okay. more going on to make it interesting. Joshua, so answer, whenever the, the you get here, no. we're playing Dominion with you. Uh -uh, yes, sir. Okay, let me just say this: as far as that goes, uh, you're gonna have to let me watch uh, a game before I even try. Yeah. yeah. Right. You can explain a game as it's happening. I cannot learn a game. Mm -hmm. Like by someone exp like explaining it to me, it just doesn't work. So yeah, no, that's no. my that's my real issue. Uh, and he's leaving Wi Fi and probably have, didn't hear any of that, but it's fine. I don't know what it is about our like brains. Oh no, Alex, why? Why are you going? Uh, Alex, you there? You alive? You can you cannot what a game, Joshua? I cannot learn a game by having it explained to me. Hmm. Fair enough. That's just not a thing for me. And I generally don't like playing games because they insist on explaining it to me instead of letting me watch a game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, um, I don't know where I can, like, 
I synthesize all of the information from all the other nope. games that I've played. Nope. Does it work? And I compile it into what I've done and what what I'm seeing. And it's like, oh, I know how to play. Um, I can't win, but I know how to play. Nope. And that's why we have Aaron because I just feed all the information to him, and then he wins. So it. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't been true when he played Twilight Imperium. The well, uh, Twilight Imperium games we have played, I have lost. Imperium. The legitimate games we have played, I have lost. I will say that. You won Twilight Imperium. Joshua, does that include, uh, that does that include card game. games? Yeah. Like, like playing card games? Yeah. That type of thing as well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Let me pull up my data sheets. I learn almost yeah. everything intuitively. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so but, having things explained to me is like, I, or, or even just trying to read the instructions. I'm like, no, I need to go watch a game on YouTube to understand how this game works. Okay. That's how, so... I, learned, that's how I learned every sport and every game that I've ever played. Except maybe okay. chess and checkers. Maybe. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, would you be able to... Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. <laughs> so, you, you, um, said, you, said you, you said you learned something intuitively. Yes. So, th- there's a game... Daniel, you've played... Uh, you have yes. played... New yeah. Vegas, right? Yeah. Okay. Have you played Caravan in New Vegas? Oh, um, <coughs> there are many things that I have started playing. Play. <laughs> There's so many levels of neurodivergence here. I just, I, this is more complicated than any board yeah, game that no. exists. <laughs> Yeah, no, I read Plot Activity from Doug Wilson, and yeah. it was like, oh, wait, you mean I don't have to, like, actually finish one task, finish the next task? Mm-hmm. I can just start everything and progressively move everything As forward. long as you can accomplish oh. some progress every day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, like, um, like I can read a chapter out of The Lord of the Rings, out of, mm-hmm. uh, like, the Westminster Confession of Faith, out of yeah, yeah. this theology book, out of... Brandon Sanderson's book, which I've still not. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, and so I'm just kind of, I have a, a finger on like everything. So. It is so neurodivergent spicy up in here right now. Just saying it it's, it's crazy. It is. Yes, it is. But yeah, you're, you're trying to um, riddle, riddle through my weirdness about board games. Part yeah. of it is a part of so it is psych- it- psychological trauma regarding over over competitive siblings, but the other half of it is okay. That's just, fair. But the other half of it is once I get a game, I'm always really good at it, and people get mad okay. at me for being good at it because so, I'm so good at it and exploitative of rules. <laughs> nice, and that's okay. That 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 that's what I'm going for. Um. You heard, you saw my yeah, your lawyer game, yeah, earlier, yeah, yeah, right? mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so bad. I'm, I'm but really. I would break that anyway. game. I'm, I'm the person you want to you test will. that game because I would break mm-hmm. that game over and yeah. over yes. and over again. Speaking of exploitative of rules, um, I was playing Secret Hitler recently, and I, I have a little a rule abuse story to tell. Um, it really annoyed the people I was playing with. But basically, um, in the game, at some point you get to see the top three cards. And um, at various points, we were able to see that the top three cards were like two liberal, one fascist, or all three liberal. And I had a realization when I saw those, and it's like, wait, if we just vote out the government every single round for nine rounds will automatically win. <laughs> and like, it's, it's, a, it's a absolutely correct argument that no liberal can argue against. So, I mean, we just, and so everyone was like, okay, I, I guess we have to do it. And, it. and they were just complaining about like, this is so, so 
boring. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, you want to win, right? <laughs> you wanna, and it's not like That's... an unknown thing. It's not an unknown thing. <laughs> okay. Um, there is a game called Pan Am. Yeah. Uh, it's based, uh, you're familiar with it? <laughs> it's a board game. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Um, Okay, so it's actually a pretty interesting and kind of fun game where you're playing a bunch of different airlines uh, that are... No, I'm not. I'm listening. Oh, okay. You're you're playing a... Yes, Pan Am, like Uh. Pan American Airlines. Um, It's super fun to play whenever you're listening to the Catch Me If You Can uh, theme. Okay. Um... But the uh, entire idea of it is that you are playing individual airlines uh, as Pan Am is rising and buying all of the airlines. That's that's the narrative that's going on. The problem is the right way to play it, like the way that you play that gets you to win is the most boring way to play the game. (laughs) So... It's like, like it is so incredibly boring because it's literally just like cash in the tokens, do the thing, try to sell your airline to Pan Am. That's how you win. Hmm. I feel like there's a good game underneath there that's fun <laughs> and interesting. The problem is it actually deals with like video game, like uncharted level Ludo narrative dissonance. Yeah. Where the way what the game is trying to say is completely at odds with the way the game is played. Huh. So it's it very sounds, interesting. It kind of sounds almost like uh, the dissonance with like the creation of Monopoly versus how it's actually used. Uh huh. Do you know what yeah. game people both love and hate to play with me? The absolute most in both categories, love and hate. What? What? Every variation of mafia, werewolf, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. Because why <laughs> I am Mr. Bluff. Nice. <laughs> um, one time I yeah. I won werewolf, uh, one night werewolf specifically, um, by uh absolutely convincing them that i was lying and what and and i was completely telling the truth that i was <laughs> like and i had i had yeah, i had them uh, back and forth on whether or not nice. i was or not and i just yeah, i just complete nice. stone faced them and it was just yeah yeah it's <laughs> very very cool yeah. Uh, yeah one of my you know one of my favorite really um, one of my favorite games in that uh, social deduction games is town of salem too um, I want to play that one. It's, it's just never really like, available with what I have. It's free on Steam. The five dollar purchase is if you want to be able to play more than five sessions in a row. But considering how long each session takes, and the fact that it's uh, well worth your time to just sit through them even after you die. I mean, you barely even need any more um, so, than five sessions. Interesting. Let me just also say, one of my favorite games to play of any sort, because I'm, you know, absolutely small potatoes guy. Um, Of course, there's been a bunch of games that I've picked up and someone's been, played over at someone's house because they did actually let me sit and watch. And I figured it out. And then I played and I destroyed everybody. <laughs> um, but uh, the the... The one that consistently is regularly like, I'll play it with anybody at any point is Crazy 8 slash Uno, just because I can talk to you while I'm doing it. Yeah. There's no thinking involved. <laughs> I can just, I, it's, it, it's, it's a cover for actually having a conversation with you because that's what I'd rather do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's fair. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's, um, with, uh, what Aaron and I have been talking about, that's, that's essentially just the game that I want to make. I cannot figure out how I want to say it, but, you know, the joke about people being a rules lawyer, that's, like, the yeah, entire yeah. premise. Um, the cred, I forgot what I was going to say. It's that's okay. Fine. We should probably get to your story here in a minute. Um, All right. 
I don't know if we're going to um, get a whole lot more people, but it's 907. And so we should probably get to that. But go ahead with what you're saying real quick. Yeah, what you're you good. I say? was just going to give you the heads up concerning my story that you're about. Yeah, to where do you want me to read? Reading. Um, there's a section right up. It's not like the end of the chapter, but chapter? there is a. It's third chapter. Third chapter, got it. Okay. Then uh, the second we we finished the second one, right? Yeah, I see. We I see four second. chapters listed. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the third chapter is the one that I was would like you to read. And uh, there is at, I'm trying to look at the page numbers. I do not see page numbers. Interesting. Let me just actually fix that real quick. Page numbers. And boop. Yeah. So that's going to make that easier to communicate. If it'll it actually is... show up on my end or not, but we shall see. Go ahead. You may need to refresh. I also may need to use desktop. And I don't think I can do that right now, given what I have going. Mm. Okay. So, but yeah, uh, go ahead. Just the, where, where from till? There's a gender reveal that is notable. And once you're there, that'll be the end. So give me the, give give me the first up. sentence of the paragraph you want me to start on. Oh, the the one you want me to, I want you to start on. Yeah, and then read to the end of the chapter, right? No, 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 I'm I'm saying start at the beginning of the chapter and then and read at... until you get to the uh gender reveal. Okay. Um I will do my best and if I'll give you a I... thumbs up. Do what? <laughs> I'll give you a thumbs up when you okay. got there. Well, I'm not going to be able like I'm back and forth, so but you can oh. yeah, you can just let me know verbally. I'll just verbally tell you then. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, okay. Start at the beginning and when you get to the end, stop. <laughs> I Sounds like a plan, plan, but I kind of am now, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah Brendan's back. Is... All right. Here we go. Chapter 3. Leanna began to dream of the boy she knew she'd never meet. The boy who would one day be king. The boy who would, who would at last slay the remaining vestiges of the shadow. Bitterly cold water awakened her. Light, sound, heat, and foul smells of waste left behind by the horses invaded her senses. Sunlight filled the carriage, causing Leanna to grumble incoherently. <laughs> You're still with us, milady. Katira smiled in hopes of offering what semblance of comfort she could. Have they assembled the carriage? Leanna asked. The answer arrived before Katira could reply. You needed your rest, so I had so I had a few of the men assist me in settling in settling you into the carriage. Katira's tendency to overexplain annoyed many, but Leanna found the girl amusing, too sweet. Too honest, too sincere. Leanna shuddered. If you'll wait here, milady. Where else would I go? Leanna asked groggily. Right. Katira felt her cheeks flush with mild embarrassment. I must ask Rin. Rin, right? Yes. Okay. I must ask Rin if, she's, if she has any herbs or accoutrements that would allow me to, uh, to make more. Would allow me to make more soothing, is what it says. Uh, mm -hmm. Do what you must, Leanna waved a weary hand. Yes, milady, Katira smirked. Leanna rolled her eyes and laid back down. Go now before I find a replacement. A small, barely noticeable smile crept across Leanna's face as Katira exited the carriage. Katira eased herself out of the carriage carefully. She unlatched the door with one hand and with the other blocked out the morning sun. As she surveyed her surroundings, she spotted a heavily armored soldier to her left. A dwarf wielding a warhammer kept a watchful eye on the fog-obscured plain around them. A human soldier 
standing a few feet away to Katira's right, began bridling the horses as more men in Pikin, Pikin, right? If I remember yes. correctly. Yeah. In Pikin's yeah. charge, in Pikin. dutifully, yeah. As more men in Pikin's charge dutifully ushered them out of the stables. Two men did their best to keep Valden upright despite his protests. The two women and the babe inside, Lienna, were encircled by the small group of soldiers. Pikin directed each soldier as they marched to and from the carriage and the stables gathering supplies. I said I don't need the help. I can walk on my own, Valden insisted. Katira anticipated the worst, so she turned on her heels quickly. She began walking towards him slowly, so she could observe the wounded soldier. One of the, one of the men raised his hands as if to say, If you say so. Upon closer inspection, it became clear that this soldier was no man, nor was, she, nor was she like anyone Katira had seen before. A tail swayed through the air, behind the slender woman. Felinor. Felinor, correct? Yes. Right, yep. Aaron? He's my, uh... Um... That works. <laughs> I think it might actually work better than what I had. Felinor, okay. There we go. Like Eleanor, but Felinor. Um, let's see. Yeah. Something I can't... Something I can help you with, miss? The Felinor's question jar jarred Katira back into the moment. She realized she'd been staring for longer than she ought to. The woman's face into view came into view at last, revealing slender, feline features and the face of a large cat on the body of a woman. Apologies, I was wearing my veil before. It's me, Rin. Valden continued to grumble at the female. Knight? Katira doubted the thought. She said she was a sister of the final order like myself, but she carried a sword. Please allow me to stand on my own. I do not require assistance. Valden continued to decline Rin's offers for assistance. He mounted his horse with an uncharacteristic lack of grace, his injuries affecting him more than he's willing to uh okay, more than he's willing to admit. Swallow your pride excuse me. Swallow your pride and accept the help, Katira shouted mirthfully. That's an order. Fine, Valden relented and extended his hand out towards Rin. Do what you must. Rin took his hand in, in hers tentatively, reached into her tunic once more and shut her eyes as if in prayer. A short moment later, Valden shivered and pulled his hand away quickly. That... that was strange, he said tersely. You feel, feel better now, though, correct? He shrugged as he prompted his steed to begin walking ahead of the carriage. Katira closed the short distance between herself and Rin. Rin turned to face approach the approaching woman fluidly. Before I forget to ask, do you have any medicines on you? I may need assistance in helping her remain calm to reduce harm to the child. I may have some things that may be of use to you. Most of the aid I can provide is through more mystical means, Rin said as she gestured to the amulet hidden within the folds of her tunic. I would be honored to assist you in whatever way you require. My midwifery training is practically non-existent, but if she or the child requires rest, that I can provide. I understand. Thank you. Katira shared a smile before turning back to the carriage to attend the queen further. Um. I take it there's more you want to ask me. Am I mistaken? Rin added, Ri excuse me. Yeah. I take it there's more you want to ask me. Am I mistaken? Rin added just as Katira returned to the carriage door. Katira paused, hand falling back down to her side. Katira tur turned back to the woman, unsure of how to respond. You carry a sword, Katira paused. I do not see that how that aligns with being a sister of the final order as you claim. I see. The woman it should be, instead of women? Or no, it's, is it women? Yep. It's women, okay. Uh, the women the stood. Sto it's yeah, women. It's yeah. The two women looking, yeah. Yeah. The women stood in silence for a moment. I am a sister of the final order, this is true. And yet you carry a sword. We are called to know no harm. Ah, a common misconception. Pardon? Curse it, I'm fixing to break my oaths. To heal and to narrow wound without just cause, the Felinor paused. 
That is, that, my dear, is the quote in full. Have you heard, have you heard of the vows of old? Rin continued. It's been far too long since I've attended the academy. But you have heard them. Yes, barely. Where are you going with this? Well, you see, there are two different things, my dear. An oath is more of a legal, a legal agreement. A vow is more of a promise. I am still not sure I understand. Katira folded her arms as she spoke. Patience, my dear, Rin said as she touched Katira's shoulder. I am a sister. I am also a herald. Though I walk the same path as you, I hold, a, I hold, to, a, I hold to a slightly different set of binding principles. You could have just said that, Katira said playfully. <laughs> per perhaps. The women smiled as they parted ways. And then we have ellipses, sort of. It goes to another scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's supposed to just represent a passage of time. I right, right, I know. More effective yeah, yeah, yeah. Game, so. That's fine. Okay. Not much, not much longer now. The, the, I don't know, Javan. Okay, that's a guy, right? Yes, yes, I should have. Yeah. Okay. okay, it's all good. It's all good. It's all. It's not you. This is just the way of no, prose sometimes. Not much longer now. The beasts are bound to get curious and move this way shortly. Javan's voice sounded behind Riker as he heaved a sack of wheat onto his shoulder. He knew better than to turn around. No telling where the fool Javan was. Giving another boy a relic is a foolish idea. One is bad enough. You were a boy once too, my friend. Riker nearly jumped, at, jumped as the thought entered his mind. That's a lady. Riker. Wait, what? You're right, sorry. Okay. Uh, the, you were a boy to once my okay. friend. Okay, so that will be a yeah. girl's voice got there. Gotcha, okay. You're he good. growled upon... I switch Riker. around a lot. Yep, yep. That's That's something you gotta make sure that you're doing your best to differentiate it's you're doing okay you're not doing as bad as you think you are <laughs> it's more my not reading good. so um i mean you're reading on the spot so sorry yeah 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 i'm reading cold so you were once a boy too what you were a boy once too my friend Riker nearly jumped as the thought entered his mind he growled upon recognizing the feminine voice get out of my damn head maya why are you so why are you committed to being such a bore she said audibly. And my business, he added tersely. If I must. Maya, a woman with a rich complexion, her skin a deep shade of brown, slid from her hiding place and exited the stable. She simply left without furthering the conversation. Silence. Blissful silence. He grunted as his ear ears popped painfully. You really should be nicer. You really should be nicer to her. And in general. Javan chimed loudly. Riker then proceeded to scream like a mad dog. Another time passage? The horses, grew s the horses steadily grew more and more nervous despite their riders' best efforts to calm them. Time had run out. The horses knew it. The air around the stable cooled suddenly, sending a chill down Pikin's spine. Time to move! he shouted. Pikin led the troop from the front accompanied by two heavily armored men that Katira had not seen before. Katira watched from inside the carriage. Excuse me. Though through the side through the side window, as Valden, who was accompanied by Rin and another woman, approached the carriage. Rin joined Katira and Liena in the carriage, while Valden assisted other men while Valden assisted the other woman onto the box. Onto the box seat. Sorry. That was me. Valden nodded at Pikin, signaling it time, sig signaling it was time to move. Pikin immediately kicked his steed and rode away, leading the troop away from the stable. Three men followed close behind. Valden handed this other woman the reins. Shortly after jumping off the carriage, Valden waved at the women and made his way to the rear of the carriage, where he joined with a small group of soldiers. The green-cloaked woman in the driver's box cracked the reins, sending the carriage surging forward. Katira returned her attention to the company within the carriage. I suppose you have some measure you have some measure in a place I suppose you have some measure in place to allow us an uninterrupted exit. Of course, my dear, 
Rin responded pleasantly. My friend, my dear friend Maya has covered, uh, has us covered in that regard. Say hello, why don't you? Hello? She wasn't speak, uh, she wasn't speaking to you, love. Katira was startled by the sudden, sudden intrusion. Her own thoughts quieted. The thoughts of another being momentarily, the thoughts of another being momentarily overshadowed her own. I assure you, our queen and the boy within her are well cared for. Boy? Katira furrowed her brow. Rin simply smiled in response. Another time passage. Though much of the uh, journey to um, the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. if you, and if you, unless you, you want to keep there? going, um, we can nah, stop it was there. good to just stop there. I haven't really completed there. everything, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That was the... Uh -huh. point there. I, I saw one tense change uh that you can fix yeah. but other than that um and you'll hear me read it it's like i, I paused on it you when you listen back you'll find it um okay. but other than that i didn't notice anything that stood out as far as like the writing i was stumbling because i'm you know my brain's starting to quiet <laughs> in the year you're good you're good so but yeah other thoughts from other folks i'll give mine in a moment First thing I specifically noticed is how very good you are at reading stuff, dude. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm trying. That's me on a. Honestly, I felt pretty embarrassed about that reading. <laughs> I was not happy with it. He wrote it. No, very you're nicely. good. <laughs> you're good. I much appreciate it. I. Uh, I cannot get through my own reading. It's like listening to my own recording. Well, your stuff is yeah. is is very fast paced in the action department even when there's not a lot of action going on there isn't a lot of sitting and this isn't a criticism necessarily because you're trying to make yeah. it seem sort of breathless as they're going from place to place to place so like you're accomplishing that um but there right. is a lack it's of atmosphere at times and okay. that was yeah. throwing me off um because yep. I didn't have time to kind of breathe between actions. I was going from action to action to action to action, which yeah. you want that, but you don't want it too much. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And so I was also dealing with in my brain. I've been reading a lot of really big theology books that have run on sentences that last paragraphs with lots of esoteric language and yours is the opposite of that only andy <laughs> wilson gets away to do gets away with that well like did, did you guys hear see the thing that i shared in the brood about how baptists write like paul yes reformed baptists write like paul like that's legitimately like that wasn't a real sentence i made that up you know whatever but those are the kind of sentences i read from some of these guys sometimes and i'm just yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, I can't even do the math on everything that you said there but it sounded pretty <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes anyway um, other thoughts so um i actually want to I'll have more to say than anyone, so I would rather yeah. other people say stuff first. Okay, I... Brendan, Alex. I'll let Brendan go. I agree with Joshua that even when there's not a lot of action, you have a lot of action, which doesn't <laughs> make a lot of sense, but... Yeah. It's... If there was one thing I kind of wished, it's that you let us know what the character, like, you kind of let us know what the characters think, but it's all external, not fully. Yeah. So, like, yeah. let me, let me, uh, I like how. The character vocalizes, get out of my damn head. And, yeah. and then when they say, thing, and stay out of my business. Like that was a great, that with him in mind. That was a great character moment for that character. You really felt that. But for all of these other characters who are going on, like Katir and all of this stuff, you, you're, you're getting, you're kind of, they're, they're almost too direct. 
if that makes any sense. Yeah. Like, they're a little too direct for how you are trying to characterize them from what I'm feeling. So there's a little cognitive dissonance there with both their action. But then there's also, you're not, you're not giving us enough, in my, in my opinion, this is my opinion, take it with <coughs> Polish salt mines levels of salt. We have um, reached the salt part of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We need Morton as uh, a sponsor. Exactly. <laughs> um, Polish salt mines. That's incredible. Thank you. You're welcome. I used and to know a Polish a salt mine name so that I can make that joke, but I, I don't remember the name anymore. Um, plus, it's Polish. You can't pronounce it anyway. Um, sure. But I, you also, you're not, in my opinion, like for characters like Katir, who are Katira. very... Katira, Katira, sorry, who are very, who are very more emotional in my mm -hmm. estimation. You don't give enough. Like Joshua called it atmosphere. For me, like yeah, atmosphere is something you need to do. You do need to set the scene and establish it. But atmosphere is also an internal thing that somebody processes, right? So yeah. I think that giving the emotional character, the time and the extra words for that emotion, I think will only help you. It yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely see where y'all are coming from. It. It's just like, right. I'm really trying to get across that they're not even really a mile away from an army that's coming after them. Um, yeah. And so the emotional side is, it's hard to balance. Right. Because it's like, you have a lot of things you're I, wanting to do. Like, if I stop to smell the roses right here, right now, I'm going to die. Right. And it's not right. so much, it's, right. but you right. as but the narrator, see. well, let me say this. Yes. You as the narrator can stop and smell the roses as much as you want without the characters, the characters doing stop. it. Right. That's right. the difference. Yeah. You have moments yeah. to let the reader breathe. You can let the reader yeah. breathe a little bit more. Don't let the characters breathe more. Let the reader yeah, breathe more. Go ahead. Yeah. And that and that's what it boils down to is just because the character feels an emotion doesn't mean they're cognizant of them feeling the emotion. Because okay. we do that literally all the time. We feel things yeah. and we don't get why. How many times have we said, I don't know why I'm this mad? Yeah. No, and you, honestly you, very often. Couldn't hear yeah. you, uh, Aaron, if you were saying something. Nothing. Yet. Okay, go ahead. Brendan. No, 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 that's, that's, I'm, that, that, that was it. The, 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 yeah. um, the only thing I was going to say on that whole anger thing is, I mean, you already have a character who's on edge. Just get out of my damn head. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you've got, you have your tension already. Right. Now, yeah, that is a character, but maybe other characters are like, that was too far. Yeah, but, I right. feel that way too, given where we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I definitely All right, want to Alex. The, yeah. yeah let, let Alex have his say and then we'll shut up. Aaron. For Aaron. And then Aaron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alex first. Alex. Um, soldiers of the Artistic Battalion, prepare for a momentary pause as we charge into the realm of commercials. I'm Ian Wilson, and I create graphic art using primarily traditional methods supplementing with digital where it's needed. I use a real pen, a real paper, a real graphite to make my art. I like to feel my art. I've always been this way. I love the feeling of a pen or pencil in my hand, the sound of graphite scratching paper, and I love the sight of a nice black line making its way across the page. So why choose traditional art over digital? Traditional art has an organic, natural quality that seems to be missing from most digital illustrations. The illustrated books and comics that were made in the days before digital have an excellence and staying power that is just as vibrant now as it was decades ago. These are the stories that stay with you. Dr. Seuss, Winnie the Pooh, Where the Wild Things Are. People still read these. I'm currently working on my own graphic novel series, Legend of the Swordbearer, and I've also had the privilege to draw graphics for two motion comic series, 
along with illustrations for a small magazine, Logosophia magazine, and various book covers. Don't let traditional art fade into the dust. Help me keep it alive. You won't regret it. Visit my website at ianthomaswilson.com for more info. In the heart of Atlanta, a city teetering on the edge of chaos, four extraordinary individuals rise as the guardians of Atlanta, an unstoppable force against the encroaching shadows. William Crusader Avery, a knight with unwavering faith, leads this divergent team joined by Cirrus Cyclone Jones, a weather controller gifted with angelic power. Bobby the Great Phantasma Carter, a master illusionist capable of bending light itself. And Amira Mira Kadru, a seemingly innocent young woman with the ability to copy powers and knowledge. As part of the coalition of underground resistances against global empire, courage, they stand as city's last line of defense against political machinations and ancient evils seeking to plunge Atlanta into darkness once more. Brace yourself for a thrilling journey into the world of Courage Universe, where epic poetry meets superheroes in Guardians of Atlanta, an electrifying serial releasing continuously in ebook, MP3, and animated video formats. Soldiers, regroup and march forward. Let the battle of ideas reignite on Poets at War. I don't have a giant amount to say, uh, except that I really like the world building. I can see the magic systems that you've crafted, and they're very interesting. Uh, I especially like the... Uh, I especially enjoy the uh, like speaking in other people's heads portion. Uh, that is a super cool uh, magic that is very rarely used, I feel like. The only time that I can think that that is used in any of the fantasy novels that I've read is like Gladriel speaking in the mind of Frodo. I, that that yeah, doesn't I seem definitely... terribly common, and I like that it's getting some use. You're definitely smelling what I'm. I'm stepping in, so yes. Uh-huh. All right, so... Aaron, go ahead, and then we have Sunshine's coming up next. Whichever you wants to go first, you can get ready. So yeah. So first off, the dialogue is pretty good, and the characters are also really great. Um, I like all the I like all the new characters you're introducing, um, and I especially liked the very very short scene you had with Riken, Riker, Riker, Riker. Um, and like it's uh, it wasn't long. It didn't have much in it. I don't think he's been in the story before this little scene. Um, yeah, then, but I snuck him in there. I, I didn't notice him. But this is basically my only interaction with the character. And um, he showed up once before in the previous chapter, whenever they had just gotten to the barn. Um, he was the guy but, talking with uh, Ren. But whatever the case, um, I uh, by the end of the scene, I was like, I was invested in his conflict. Um, of you know not wanting to deal with telepathy, <laughs> and also um, extremely worried when he started screaming like a mad dog. What is happening? <laughs> oh, he's just voicing his frustration. It sounded to like me like, like yeah. It, it, to me, it sounded like somebody attacked him and that he was screaming in pain. And I was to like, me, it sounded oh, like he just went is mad. He dying? It, to me, it sounded like he was dying and screaming in pain. <laughs> yeah, same, that, that's same, same what here. it sounded like to every. That is definitely what it sounded like to everyone outside the carriage, <laughs> so, uh, outside the barn. So, yeah. Okay, but um, but I to but also I don't I really don't like Katira's accent. I don't know what it what it is. It's um the way it's written it's like it's mix of southern lady and something else I can't describe. And it's like or southern grandma and something else I can't describe. And it's like I I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> like on on a different character I'd be like that's 
great, yeah. but I just don't feel that with, like, it just feels weird with the main character. Doesn't seem mm. like a main character personality. <laughs> Oh, I kind of wanted to make an specific villain main character, so I feel yeah. like I did the thing there. Are you okay, Brendan? Yeah, I'm fine. Ignore me. And <laughs> the one final thing is, right now, I don't think anyone's... N it sounds like nobody has noticed yet, but it is very much the case that currently... Um, mine and Dan's stories, The Legend of Two Elves, and The Maiden's Child, they're kind of sort of operating on different magic systems. Neither of us really understand what the other one's doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're connected. They are connected. I mean, they're um, similar, but they, they should be the same? <laughs> in a way. That's kind of what I was trying to hint at with the conversation. Like, things have changed in this world that are above yeah. your head. And you don't quite understand it yet, child, but that's not what is, what's important. Let's save the boy. Let's save this boy. She goes, yeah. Boy, and then it's like, huh? And then yes. she's like, huh, it's okay. Um, like I said, things you don't understand. And the section that wasn't mentioned, that wasn't uh, talked about, um, and that wasn't read, there was a mention of silver swords, and that is something that is important in the legend of two elves it's some it's a connection between the two series right now oh. <laughs> that's why we have this book we yes the order of the silver swords yes um, sounds like you guys are really starting to click i love it <clears throat> but um the the felinor that's their new name it was previously felatos but felinor works better um um I, I, felinor i as it was researching what you said, no. <laughs> no. It's fine. Okay. It's a fine word. It's just a little uncomfy and close to other things. I was like, eh. Whatever. Um, okay. Anyways, th they're... In the, in the world building I've done, they don't have an interaction with Karatua. They're... Like, they live close by, but they're like an isolationist, super secretive hermit kind of society. So... I know this, Aaron. So <laughs> you know this already? So this character, you have something planned with this character. Why would she be in the book if I didn't? I mean, of course. I just don't know what you're planning. Exactly. <laughs> and that will have to eventually be communicated. Oh, boy. All right. All right. Well, we can move on to the sunshines. Which of y'all wants to get moving on? What you got? First, I have a wife. You have a wife. Hello, she shall wife. go first. Hello, wife. <laughs> Hello. Have you guys heard that TikTok sound where the guy's like, uh, uh, ride wife, life good. Wife angry, yes. kill wife. <laughs> He's like, Ooh, now hey. sad, no wife. <laughs> it's like a caveman thing. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, my thing is really short. So, um, but I, um, yeah, I don't want to introduce any character. Like, I haven't. So, I, I saw that I watched this video about um, like writing advice. And one of the things is said, like, write your rough, rough draft first, like, all yeah. the way through. Mm -hmm. And then start, like, like before you share it with anyone. But uh, even though I have, I want to have a character-driven story, um, I, would, I would like to introduce the world building. So that, yeah. like, just to give, like, just for <laughs> advice and... Yeah. Um, because I yeah. tend to really overthink things, so. Um, That's the understatement of the century. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so I'll start. Wait, let's see. I'll start with a sentence that I like. My my, I'm planning on a lot of tragedy in my story with okay. with hope, but a lot of tragedy. So. So far, what I'm writing is not going to convey that tone, I don't think. But, um, but this should introduce the world a little bit. <clears throat> my, 
Malumia is a strange country, not because of the mountable birds, the volcano-loving bears, the helpful beasts, tree beasts, or even the Senate governing alongside the Sahas ruler, but because of this age-old supernatural battle. Um, so that just kind of introduce, like, gives a brief, like, I don't know if that will be my opening uh, thing, but basically there's a country with um, a lot of strange um, creatures that, supernatural creatures that interact with the country and with humans and have kind of a symbiotic relationship with humans, I guess. So yeah. I don't know if that. So more symbiotic little, than something we would we would generally deal with. Gotcha. I'm I'm following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, I decided that there's eight types of like animals and creatures that are like unique to us, but that are like regular animals that you know, like kind of like in if you think in Chronicles of Narnia, sort of like the the dumb animals, but yeah. then there's ones. Of the eight, there's ones that are supernatural and, but only, it's sort of like in Avatar The Last Airbender, only yeah, if I was thinking you're that. of a certain blood can you interact, you can see all of them, but you can only interact with one kind, but then the special ruler that it's not passed down by lineage, but it's, it's sort of like judges, it's, no one has okay. a dynasty, it's, they're just mysteriously chosen from above, I guess, or okay. from the supernatural powers. They have been chosen by the <laughs> magical pointer clicker in the sky. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Pretty then, much. Uh, I, so I said I wasn't going to introduce characters, but just, this sort of gives an idea of the, the drama surrounding the, like the ruler and everything so so are the eight in (laughs) harmony or like is that the general default of the world that the eight are in harmony with the world and with each Uh, other or do they fight i think that so basically uh so the this the reason that you have one person that can interact with all of them is because uh there's an evil entity called this that I've so far just called the swarm. I don't know if that, it's just, they basically, they can turn these animals, not the, I don't know if yet, yeah, if it's the supernatural creatures or a different type of creature, they can turn them evil, uh, the same kind and basically create evil entities. And by my point in the story, it's sort of like, there's been this, long line of even though there's been these chosen rulers like they had the potential to do a lot of great and unite the the eight region like it's also by like creates regions um like by uniting them but then there were so many bad rulers that by the time there's been the latest one in my story who's not like one of the main characters uh she she's the queen and she is one of the first that is like okay i she's heroic she tries to do good with her powers but because of just everything's a mess by her time so then then to make matters more dramatic in my story like she's supposed to at some point have the next heir be found and then train them basically teach them and four of them until the story starts have been murdered and not by her but um but it creates even more like problems and so basically my i do have a summary for uh my story that i wrote so far um (laughs) if we can find it yeah so, is this it? yeah, uh, I wrote, in a strange kingdom, royal heirs are mysteriously chosen, but new heirs keep mysteriously dying. A young, a young woman with the help of super, supernatural entities 
pretends to be heir to the throne until the threat to her cousin's life is gone. So basically, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a, what I have so far. And I have plans for a antagonist who slowly gets, who, who at first escalates in evil, but then hits a like, a point where it, I don't know, I, I want it to be kind of like Zuko, I guess, but I don't want exact Zuko. So kind of like Zuko and Jinx <sighs> from Arcane. <laughs> So, so, so Daniel so is losing not... his mind. <laughs> anyway, I just want to point that uh, yeah. out. We're um, not calling on you yet. Not calling on you yet. Just saying he's losing his mind. What, Go ahead, Brendan. What, what what bothers me is that she's told me more stuff about the story <laughs> and the various inceptions, and she's not even telling you the mo, mo what, in my opinion, are the most interesting parts. Oh, <laughs> oh of course not. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead, Daniel. How many of us have stories featuring young women protecting the heir to the throne? <laughs> From otherworldly entities, and she's working for the forces of... Yes. <laughs> it's just it's very neat how we're all like, yeah, yeah let's all tell, like... Mm. Yeah. I definitely find the idea of pretending to be the heir to, the heir yeah, to that's be interesting. Cool. What well, what does that mean Prince that she has popper, to fake control over magical on. powers? What can I share more? Sure. Or? Okay. <laughs> so here's here's what she's not telling you. <laughs> the queen has a daughter. Oh yeah. <laughs> the okay. daughter is being groomed by one of the Senate people to try to become a usurper. To take because because. Why should these magical spirits have a say in our government? That doesn't make sense. I like that a lot. <laughs> and so I like that. it's yeah. heavily implied that the usurper guy, the groomer, is the one who's offing the kids. Right. But then, Ooh. but then, and that's why the cousin of the actual heir, who is a she in this case, is the one right. pretending to be the heir so, so that, that they'd go after it. her instead of the real heir. Mm -hmm. ah. But wait. Oh, it, like a Padme on the ground. But yeah. wait, it gets more interesting because this daughter of the queen, she goes full crazy and ends up falling in love with the real heir. <laughs> but he doesn't fall in love with her. But he doesn't her. fall in love with her. So it's kind of, so it's a little, kind of a tragic love. Change. It's a little, a little craziness there. It's, it, and yeah, there's another thing that I'm not going to share that she's, that, that she's thinking of doing involving the villainess. But this whole thing got started because she wanted to write an evil Disney princess. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> that is great. Like, do you see how creative this woman is? <laughs> yes. Well, I have to actually try to write it down. Is the problem? Well, you read some stuff I mean, that you wrote, all. and that's a start, you know. And you're here, so we're gonna be yeah. cheering you but on yeah, and about... saying, "Where's our Dis evil Disney princess?" Gall darn it! Come on, <laughs> Kira. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> about the uh, little piece of writing advice you got from that video where, like you said, like, write out your entire rough draft before you even have people start writing it. I definitely see the value in doing that, but you got to find what works for you ultimately. So it's like. Also, yeah, what's the rule for D&D? &D? What's the what, Brendan? What's the rule for D&D &D about fun? Uh, rule of cool. Yeah. yeah. Rule or of cool. Is it cool to share? Yes. Sharing is cool and yeah. fun. <laughs> Sharing is cool. Keeping it to yourself until you have a lot to share is also cool. Do what, yes. do what you whatever you want to do. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. <laughs> That's like I said earlier in the group chat, it's not cheating if we're all if you're making it up as you go. So like by the time you have a published work out there, it probably won't look like what it does right now. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully one day Alex, we'll be able to look back at these broadcasts and be like, oh yeah, that was when I was at that point in the story. And people who <laughs> will have been read our published works will be like that too. Oh my goodness, they were, oh, that's cool. Anyway, that's what I'm hoping for anyway. Alex, do you have anything you want to say to Kirith? <laughs> if he's still listening. 
If he's still here, he's probably not. Okay. Hello. Is. I I am I am still here. I have been trying to set up uh, other things and uh, have not been able to actually pay attention. I am very sorry. I will try to go back through and listen to it and give the uh, actual thought and ideas to everybody. Awesome. Thank I'm you. sorry. Okay, you're fine. Also, Casey, okay. feel free to chime in whenever if you want to. Um, she actually been has out. been. Oh, I know. Yeah, in in, the, uh, in text in the in the brood. Let's see what she said. Why not? I know. Uh, I saw a few things. She said, "You read it like a you read it like a movie trailer. Love it." And she said, "At least you don't write terrible metal songs." <laughs> What's that sort of thing? I don't know. What are you talking you about with not, metal you can't songs? Deny there are some terrible metal songs. There yeah. are terrible metal songs. Um, some of my favorite, like in the ironic way, terrible metal songs are songs like. Um, Oh, basically anything by Manowar that is uh, using the word steel not only to refer to swords, but also motorcycles. Anyway, that's, the, <laughs> that's really super fun. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, all right. So now we have Brendan, and I think that's going to be our last one tonight, unless anyone else shows up or says anything, unless uh, Alex oh. still wants to read him and Debbie, if not. It's cool. No big deal. Brendan, you have... I'm thinking that we have enough to pitch. I, okay. Um, All right. We'll do Brendan first, and then we'll do Alex and Debbie if they're good to go at that point. So I am going to be honest. I don't really have a ton. Um, I, don't ha I haven't gotten much written past the brainstorming session, but I'm really happy yeah. with the brainstorming session. So I'm going to... That was our last I'm one going two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago. Uh, my sister has been in town. She's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> but somewhere in here is a Word document. Assuming it didn't get deleted. Oh, fading wild summary thing. Here we go. Here we go. Next. We are going to minimize the famine of 1317. All right, so this is actually going to just be a complete summary of episode two. Um, starts off with them journeying. Um, they, you, you, I read last time how Ava and Aram end up in the Feywild. Basically, um, Aram prays. He, uh, as he's praying, we don't know what he's saying, but something triggers, and they're in what's called Summer Forest. Um, so Ava and Aram have a talk with the Pilgrim, blah, blah, blah. You read that. Um, but then they decide to go into the city of the Summer Forest, um, the main capital of the, what's, the realm is called Summer Forest. I don't have a name for the city uh, yet. I might come up with one, but I'm not getting that far. Um, Here's the one you Ava found over there. Um, yeah, the, yeah, anyway. As they go to the city, Ava picks flowers. This is important. Save that for later. As they go through the city, because they're, they're not exactly great at hiding their identity, basically every fae within like a hundred mile radius is like, that's a human. Hold up, that's a human. And like Ava overhears, she's an adult. She can't be an adult. Adults don't have enough wonder. We always send them back before they get back. That get that big. How is she not gross? She doesn't stink <laughs> and all these sort of weird little things. Uh, they go into the equivalent of a general store because work with me here. Um, and uh, there, you, there you have a. Well, there will be a cutaway to Oberon, the king of the the Lord of Summer, hearing about this. Though we don't reveal his face because I, Brendan, am an overdramatic twit. Um, I have that written down, so I had to read it. <laughs> Um, they trade, uh, they trade for, uh, they do some trading for clothes for Arm, and while the Fae, while, um, and then I have a note here that the Fae that resides and sort of is in charge of the forest that Ava picks flowers from, um, and picks herbs from and sort of kind of cares for, recognizes her and vouches for her, um, at one point, she, the Fae uh, tries to offer her water, but a mint leaf falls into it. 
oh, and then the Fae says, oh, I can't give that to you now. It's food, and it's bad for you humans to eat our food. And Ava's like, what are you on about? A mint just fell into it. It's still water. It's just mint water. And the Fae goes, no, but that would make it mint broth. And Ava's like, huh? <laughs> so that reveals <laughs> weird Fae nonsense. While this is happening, Aram's greaves get stolen. And basically, for throughout the entire rest of the episode, he's chasing these pixies through the city, um, or at least Faye through the city, to get his greaves back. Um, up until the climax. Ava asks why water is always free to her new uh, Faye friend, and they say that water gives life, life is good. Then Ava says, but doesn't food give life? And the Faye goes, that's different. Faye goes, how? Uh, Ava goes, how? And the Faye says, I... Don't know. Let's ask someone. Uh, <laughs> and then Ava points out, well, we need to figure out how to get back home. And the Fae goes, well, that's in the same direction, so why don't we all just go that way anyway? Aram continues to chase the fairy. Oberon is trying... Meanwhile, Oberon is busy trying to research Aram's name, but they can't find it anywhere. It seems this is just sort of a point. Um... They go to the palace to research, and at this point, it's revealed that Ava's an herbalist, and everyone goes, oh, that makes sense. And Ava's like, huh? At this point, you find out that herbalists are sort of descended from Fey teaching. So that's a little fun thing there. Um, Oberon then, at this point, takes an interest and invites Ava into the throne room. We're going to have the last cut of Aram chasing the fairy here. And then Ava takes those flowers that she picked from the forest, puts them in a beaker or vial or something, a bit of water, and she gives the flowers as a gift to Oberon when she enters the throne room, basically saying, listen, my lord, you have you summoned me. It is wrong for me not to come to a lord's home without a gift, so here's a gift. And Oberon takes the flowers. They wildly bloom. He smells them, and he says, I love this. This is amazing. When, uh, when one of his court people point out that these flowers came from the summer forest, they're yours, he says, but she made them better. She put herself into it by arranging them and providing them with a vessel. Humans were always amazing at that. At this point, Oberon agrees to answer any three of Ava's questions. Ava asks, um, basically, how do we get home? Oberon begins to reveal, uh, sort of says, well, that's a little tricky. You can do a couple of different ways. Then he asks her a question, why do you need to get home? And she says, well, I need to bring my friend back to, um, to where he belongs. And he goes, oh, the falling star? He doesn't belong on Earth. He belongs uh, on top of the mountain here. Um, and he then reveal, and then Ava says, okay, well, then that's great. How do I get to the mountain? And at this point, Oberon reveals the nature of the Feywild and how it is ever changing. Basically, um, basically all this, uh, basically the fact that the realms, while they realms have spatial continuity, they don't have spatial continuity within themselves. So all of the realm, all of the continents and countries are shifting all the time. And so it makes it almost impossible to get to where you want to go unless it is, they say it is destiny or it is unless your will is strong enough to get there. Um, at this point, uh, Oberon, um, Ava reveals that she needs to get do this because of the blight. Oberon offers her a chance to stay and research the blight without having to take that silly man back to his home. Ava's considering it, but before she can answer, Aram crashes through the glass roof of the of the um, throne room with the fairy, like in a <laughs> chokehold. At this point, um, there are words exchanged. Um, Aram is belligerent and says, "Basically, I will not bow the knee to a coward," referring to Oberon, the uh, lieutenant, the sort of captain of the guard, takes extreme offense at Oberon being called a coward, though Oberon does not seem to say anything at this point. And um, they start fighting, and Aram basically kicks the entire royal guard's butt. 
while this is happening, one of the other Fae recognize him and say, that's the wolf of heaven. And when he says this, Aram realizes his identity is about to be revealed and like full force chucks a spear at the um at the Fae, like going to kill him, but Oberon saves the Fae fairy's life, um, which is good for Aram, actually. And Oberon goes, okay, I know who this is. And Oberon, and once all the guards are down, Oberon says, I know your name, Stardust. And Aram defiantly says, then use it. Oberon says, seriously? You would taunt the Lord of Summer in his throne room. Aram, I would die before I bend the knee to one who disobeyed the rightful king. Oberon says, then die, Sirius of the heavenly sky. But nothing happens. Aram says, your magic is waning, king. And Oberon says, it seems so. Then I shall do this the old-fashioned way. He turns into a giant tree monster, pulls out a flaming sword. Because, of course. Is, and is about to strike when Ava jumps in the middle and yells, I want to ask my last question. Ooh. And Oberon goes, we're we're kind of in the middle of something. And Ava goes, no, no, I want my question. And Aram is just like, what? And Oberon just laughs and goes, all right, ask. And Ava says, what's your true name? And then there's <laughs> oh, a snap. Oh, then snap. Then there's <laughs> sni- silence. And Oberon starts cackling like a, like, not like a madman, but starts laughing. And he basically says, you've got Moxie, you've got Chutzpah. I love that. I love, I love you, human. You are great. <laughs> you know what? Sure. And he brings her over and he whispers her, his name in her ear. We don't hear it. And then Ava's, and Ava's like, and, 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 and Ava says, thank you, my lord. May we leave? And he says, I can't stop you. I gave <laughs> you know you my name. name. <laughs> you know my name. I can't stop you. Nice. Go with my blessing and also get some better clothes, you twit. And that's how they're able to leave. Um, <laughs> and that that's is the end of, and that's the end of the episode. Nice. That's nice. fantastic. Uh, right? well, we worked hard on this. <laughs> Yes, that's that's awesome. What was the name of the big fey dude that they were fighting, and then she tried Oberon. To Oberon. He's Oberon. the king of the his... of the summer forest. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he is the lord of the summer forest. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we added that's like world building things that will probably get explained in later episodes, but maybe not. For example, Aram has actually two names. One right. name is a title. That, not a it's title, but it's rank. like a rank. It's his... it's his rank in the army. And basically every angel has a unique rank that is their name that they use. But they also have a true name. Aaron's true name, name. is yeah. Sirius. Yeah, his personal name. Yep. But it's also was because it didn't work. So the fact that his true name didn't work is meant to be foreshadowing something later on. Oberon having a flaming sword is sort of meant to imply that Oberon was one of the cherubim guarding Eden. Ooh. Ha, huh, I see. So what? Uh, what's this magic system with true names? It's fey. Like, all the, like, the folk tales. It's a classic fey thing, yeah. I'm getting. It's a classic I, I don't understand. So, like, if you use a person's true name, you can get them to do whatever they want, whatever you want. If you have a true name, you can control them. That's the general jest. That's why the Pilgrim warns Ava in the beginning, never tell them your real name. Now, generally speaking, Mm -hmm. Fae know how to wield this far better than humans do, or even necessarily angels do, because angels have more of a direct power over things uh, as per whatever their rank is. Right? More more or less? Sort of. Sort of, kind of, not really. It's, It's... you have to realize this is a hyper soft world with hyper yes. soft magic and stuff. Mm-hmm. So the rule, like I have some rules in my head, but the lion's share is that words have power. True name has power over the subject. Yes. Yeah. Um, one thing, uh, one idea that just crossed into my mind, um, you know how um, in Revelation it often talks about how the saints will have new names that are known to no one. Exactly. Um, I was just 
you know, that crossed my mind is like, well, in like in a very real sense, like we as humans, we don't even know our true names yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. (laughs) But with air, this is a setup for the end when the pilgrim, which it comes out is basically the Holy Spirit says, I named the Michael. Uh-huh. Gotcha. I see. And that is a, this is like, I want it to any reformed people watching this. This is fiction. <laughs> this yes. is not <laughs> real. I know it's not real. Get your heads out of, of your <laughs> stitchy little nonsense. Okay. <laughs> this is we actually, we just had this conversation and um, any of our artistic expressions of different attributes of God are going to fall short if we're trying to represent like any character of the right, God exactly. head. And so yep, yep, really yep. more, it sounds like you're touching on specific qualities and attributes yes. that point to something. Well, this is this is a potential. This is a sort of vague origin story for the Archangel Michael. Yeah, cool. It's not even God. <laughs> right, right. So, and, and like, yeah. one one thing I love doing and love seeing uh, in literature, like I'm trying to get through the Lord of the Rings, is you see like characters like Gandalf, you see Aragorn, you see Sam, you see the the friend that stays with you, you see the king that returns for you, you see the, um, there was a, a another analogy for Gandalf and a camp. The prophet, right? priest, and king, Frodo, Gandalf. Yeah, and, you see the prophet, Aragorn, yeah. the priest, yeah. Okay. Prophet, priest, king, yep. Yep. So, yeah. Well, let me, let me, uh, we're going to hang out some more if y'all want to, but let me go ahead and wrap this one up. Everybody, uh, be your family's bard. Wait, no, hold on. Alex and Debbie, were you guys going to share? Are we sharing? King, we'll get an answer. Hello? 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 There we are. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Okay, one sec. Let me switch to video. Awesome. Okay. So, number one. Welcome to the first broadcast from our home. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> um, okay. So. Here's the basic idea. One sec. Do you want a mirror bud so that you can hear? <laughs> One sec. Yes, you should be able to. Oh, but I'm just there. Your beds there. Um. Okay. So the general idea uh, that we came up with is it's an adult cartoon. Specifically, we're thinking this would work really well as a war show. Okay. A and a lore L- show. Lore Marcus Pittman's lore.tv. Uh, yeah. Oh, anyway. yeah. 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 So the central premise is about uh, two couples. Uh, the first is like your classic power couple. Uh, she was a cheerleader in high school. Uh, she now runs a like very successful fashion house in uh, like upstate New York and thinking type thing. But like, some form of rural, but not entirely out of the way area is where this uh, show takes place. Um, her husband was a like well put together geek in high school, but still a geek in high school. They ended up getting married. The second couple. So she was what? a boy or he was a boy. She was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, there we go. Um, I, got me. I almost I almost messed that up. I almost messed that up. Anyway. So the second couple is uh very much more of like a normal couple. Uh like they go to church every Sunday, uh they have uh like their house uh I'm thinking 
like average average American dream uh, kind of feel to it. Uh, but like homeschoolers uh, and like he is a like owns his own hardware store that that type of couple Do you get that like are you getting the yeah. feel that we're going for a little yeah. bit yep. um so she's homeschool mom that type of thing and the core plot of the show is that uh the power couple is trying to take over the world because uh, I forgot to say, he's like a tech startup guy. Like he, he's okay. he runs a very successful tech startup, and they are trying to like they are actively trying to take over the world. The core premise, uh, the the core idea behind this is uh, basically what can you hear, Debbie? No, we cannot hear Debbie. Here. She's brown. No, but it's still not. It's it's cutting her out. Still not working. Okay, yeah, one yeah. sec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One sec. We're switching off your buds or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Whatever you got to do. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So she's bribing him to take over the world for her, essentially. Like she's <laughs> the one that wants to take over the world, and she's using him to do it. <laughs> okay. Oh, you were getting cut out. Now. Um, and they keep getting foiled by the normal couple doing like normal everyday couple things. Is the idea? <laughs> okay, like so normal family, comedy. actively uh, or yes, passively? It's a comedy. Very much a comedy. Think, 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 Family Guy, like in that vein, but Christian and funnier hopefully so so are 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 the, the okay. blue collar family active passive or a combination of the two like uh, in the foiling um in the foiling they're going to start so what i'm wanting to do is start off pretty small with a like each episode is individually contained type thing right but yeah. then slowly work to an actual like larger plot okay is the yeah, idea so like so, like, at the end of each episode, you have, like, a little Easter egg or you have something sprinkled in yeah. all throughout and kind of tie it together. Yeah, so something like that is the idea. Okay. And So, what was the main antagonist? I got more of the protagonist. Main antagonist is, a, like, traditional power couple. Uh, she's a successful fashion designer. He owns, a, like, he is the founder of a successful tech startup type thing. Um. And the entire, this is where, this is why it has to be an adult cartoon and not a, a kid's cartoon. The entire, uh. So you know how I said that she was bribing him? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So what she's yeah, yeah. bribing him with is herself. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that, they're That's married. That's more like and bargaining? She's saying, That's bargaining. It, it, yeah. it, if you want, if you want me to sleep with you, you have to take over the world. Right, right. Or if you and, don't want me to divorce you. Yeah. Right, as, exactly. oppo as opposed to the normal everyday couple who have, you know, a passel of kids. And he's and enough of a thing. nerd that he is afraid that she will just leave him and replace him. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's I'm totally following. Yeah, okay. So so they start out passive, the, 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 the protagonist family. Start mm -hmm. out passive in their foiling and move toward a more active mm -hmm. role. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Okay, yeah. gotcha. It is right. the thought that I we we just came up with this like two days ago. You know or what my immediate so you know what my immediate reference for this is? What? Pinky and the brain. What are we gonna do to, yes. to, to, tomorrow, wife? Yeah, kind of. For, I know. My husband tried to take I mean, over uh, the world. The one I was thinking of was Phineas and Fur because it sounded like a fighting doofenshmirtz kind of situation. Pinky in the brain oh, versus Pinky in the brain versus Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately As married like couples, anyway. I immediately thought uh, Emperor's New Groove. He's my uh, Kronk. Yep. Yep. <laughs> there you He's go. He's my Kronk. <laughs> but yeah, that's the idea. I love it. Yeah. This sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. This sounds super I think like fun. the implication with Yzma and Chrome, it, it doesn't necessarily like you just gotta wait the right topics for it to be more general audience than not. 
But yeah, no. Any which way. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, anything further on that from anybody, uh, either feedback wise or anything you guys want to add before I wrap things? Mm-hmm. Anybody? It sounds like a really all fun right. concept. I want to see where well, y'all I, take it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I might help you out with that. Like, you know, yeah. getting it ready for pitch or whatever, but. All right, everybody, be your family's bard. Do not turn to the right or to the left, and the Lord will be with you wherever you go. Hope you enjoyed the new format. And uh, if you have a, um, a a clip that you want to see, there is a time code of the exact actual time, Eastern time, on this video that you'll see in the future, you guys. You don't. Anyway, but you get the idea. And you can let me know what time code you want to see a clip from. I have two so far. I'm trying to fill six. I appreciate you guys' help on that. Uh, and the Lord will be with you wherever you go. We'll see you next time in the trenches on Poets at War. We're lying, we chill, warning him. Our imaginations run wild and free in middle-earth or Narnia. There's magic in what we believe, believe. This has been the broadcast on the Poets at War creative network. Inkling-style Discord chat. Last Friday of every month to join our ranks of writers and artists so you can share your works and skills, please visit joshuadavidling.com slash brood.